And welcome to Gleaming and a Geek, the We Traded for the Outfielder edition. I'm John Bonus of TwinsDaily.com. With me, Aaron Gleaming at The Athletic. Hello, John. The contractually obligated athletic. <laughs> yes. We are coming to you uh, from 1,000 miles apart again. Or 1,200 yep. miles apart, something like that. John has slightly changed locations. He still loves Florida. He oh. can't leave Florida. Boy, I really loved Florida yesterday during the three and a half hour drive from Northport to Tampa. Which is supposed yeah. to be a two-hour drive. Yeah, traffic talk. That's what oh, people in Minnesota want. Uh, yeah, what Florida a is. Florida is. Florida. Let me say this about Florida because <laughs> I'm going to have to go back there next year, so I don't want to say that much. But it earns okay. its reputation. Let's say that. <laughs> that is correct. You know, like uh, I, I'm fond of writing of prospects. Like Ed yeah. Julian, Eddie Julian last year came up. He was a. He didn't swing at anything bad, and he drew a million walks. <laughs> right. I always say he he was as advertised. Florida is as advertised <laughs> in every possible way you could right. think of. Uh, good, maybe good, bad for sure. Yeah. Uh, we have made it, you and I, successfully, and the listeners, I suppose. Hi, everyone. To the month in which actual regular season baseball games will be played. It is now yeah, opening right. month. Yes. We did it. <laughs> it's only four weeks now. Well, uh, and we've seen a lot of baseball in the last week, too. Uh, yeah. We have, yeah, a lot of... A lot of baseball. I've been to seven games in seven days. I've got a game scheduled today, a game scheduled tomorrow, and then uh, then we'll take a little break for three weeks and wait for opening day to start. We saw a lot of bad baseball, I feel like. And maybe that's true, <laughs> that's true in the first phases of spring yeah. training every it's, year, and I just sort of It's forget. spring training for everybody, yeah. Yeah. A lot of bad infield defense, outfield defense. Yeah. A lot of just plays that you're like, what the f- what was that? <laughs> uh, but no, you know they got four weeks to clean that up. But the thing you always forget, or I always forget, is in a lot of these early spring training games, you go, "Well, that's a play that should be made." But then you go, "Oh, it's a you know single A shortstop playing." Well, that's true too. Or yeah. you know whatever the left fielder you know spent last year double A. Right, it's like, yeah. well, yeah, it should be made by a major leaguer. Those guys might never be major leaguers, and it certainly won't be this year. But so that's something <laughs> to remember. But we uh, we've made it to March. The Twins open. March twenty eighth, I want to say, in Kansas City. That's right, and then and then in Milwaukee. After that, and we will probably be opening with a uh, watch party, opening day watch party at Forgotten Star. I don't have all the details on that yet, but try and keep that open, folks. Yeah, we we, we being me Twins and Twitch Daily. Daily. <laughs> I will not be <laughs> probably there. not Eric Gleeman. I will be on my couch <laughs> uh, with a bad that, hip. Oh, I got a bad hip, folks. Any what's a hip doctor? What is that? Orthopedist or something? Yeah, something like that. Any any hip doctors out there? I think I got a a rod situation here. Uh, anyway, in my, it it really wrecks me because I was in such pristine health. I know physically, were, mentally before this. You were really edge your way. Yeah, yeah. People saw me and they thought, "Wow, that's a guy who's got it going." <laughs> Can't and believe then, he'd have hip problems. Right? Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna go to the doctor. And I'm gonna be like, "Doctor, I have a hip problem. I don't know why." And they're gonna go, "You don't know why? Really? <laughs> really?" have you seen that we invented this thing called a mirror um anyway hi uh we let's see what have we well first of all i wanted to say thank you last week we were the number one podcast in baseball or the number one baseball podcast in the country i should say uh, on apple which is remarkable because uh it was just sort of us talking about spring training there was no (laughs) it wasn't even emmanuel Margot, which is hardly you know massive news in the baseball world so we'll see if we can get the top spot again talking about an actual trade that they made uh, for Manny Margot, but thank you for that. Is a good way to. It is, uh, ama- it is a little amazing to me that uh, yes, a quote unquote small market team or mid market team like the Twins consistently has a podcast that's like in the top three, four, five. It does show a little bit that yes. Twins fans are willing to go out of their way to go and get uh, additional coverage about this team. And th- uh, yeah, the the extra amazing. barrier for entry being they have to listen to us. <laughs> exactly. You know what I mean? It's not. This is like, oof, boy, they're really into it. Because man, uh, yeah, we. I think last season, I think we put out I don't know forty five free shows out of fifty two weeks or something like that, roughly. Maybe a few more than that. I bet you even more. Uh, I believe every single one was in the top ten, or put oh. us in the top ten. And I think we hit the number one spot like maybe 10 or 11 out of the 52 weeks. Wow. 
which yeah that's remarkable because you and know these are national podcasts that we're talking about yes this is just like that's uh, what right i take some sense in of pride in the fact that we like even when we're like third or fourth the ones ahead of us are always national shows like they're right. from cbs or they're from john boy or they're from whatever and we're all almost always i would bet like two-thirds of the weeks we are the number one non-national like local team-based podcast so i do take a sense of pride in that on the other hand it makes me want to murder the national ones john boy especially <laughs> yeah you heard me Oof. we're coming after you trevor yeah, we aren't really because it's like god they got we almost got number one again but these bastards at john boy. uh and, and the thing that's been screwing us up lately and keeping us from number one during the off season is uh mike francesa Who's like been a oh, really? New York radio yeah. legend for like forty right. years, and I don't yeah, even right. think is on the radio. Mike anymore. and Mike, right? Yeah, from Mike, uh, Mike and the Mad Dog. Yeah, Mike and the Mad Dog, right? Yeah, um, right. but he's not. A, he's like you know, old, and he's has like a podcast, I guess. And it's for some reason his producer, or whoever, marks it as a baseball podcast, and so it's always like number two, number one on the baseball podcast. But the episode titles are always like our Friday NFL picks. It's like that's the number <laughs> one baseball podcast. So that annoys me, but. I wanted to say thank you uh, to everyone. We uh, hopefully this is kind of the start of ramping up towards the season. We'll start to kind of look ahead roster wise. We have some of that today because the Margot trade kind of draws into focus the the roster almost completely. I mean, from the position player side, I think we now know, barring injuries, obviously, right. we know one hundred percent of the position player roster, or at least their plan, uh, barring some unforeseen circumstances. We should we also, also we should we should also warn you that next week there won't be a free podcast while we're talking about the free podcast. I'm going to be traveling quite a bit over the next week, and in fact, I'm going to be traveling quite a bit over the next three, four, five months, years. So <laughs> there's, we're going to have to skip some, definitely a couple in April, at least one in June, probably one in May. So you know, we just encourage it. Uh, if you want more baseball coverage, check out the Patreon, Patreon.com/slash Gleeman. John is at some point relatively soon going to Japan for a significant length of time to visit his son. <laughs> right. And watch and, baseball. Sure. <laughs> um, you're saying you don't like your son. Is for that tax purposes. I think we just need to clarify that. Uh, I'm also going to watch baseball. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, <laughs> we report a little bit on the, IRS on the can, Japanese baseball. Sure. can pull that clip right there. <laughs> And I said, John told me the dates he's going to be in Japan. And he said, uh, well, we get back on a Friday. So we could probably record the normal podcast we do on Friday. Let's just do that Saturday. And I said, well, John, you know, this is going to be jet lagged. You're coming back. You're almost in Japan for like three weeks. You're going to want to land after that flight and then talk to me about the twins, you know, the next morning. And I said, well, we could just push that back. And John said, oh, can't can't really do that the reason we're flying is we're going to a wedding immediately and i just thought what a what a life to lead like what a <laughs> you're a real jet setter in the in the realest way meanwhile <laughs> i came back from uh, 11 nights in uh, fort myers and i'm like if i have to leave the couch once in the next three weeks i'm gonna kill someone <laughs> doordash is your new best friend yeah or not, not new best old, friend. old best friend yeah. Yo, we're, we're <laughs> married best friend. Yeah. uh one of the things we saw before I left the uh, spring training is Byron Buxton making his first major league appearance in center field. He did play like two thirds of a game for the saints in September when he was trying to prove to the twins that he could be on the playoff roster. And that did not go real well. <laughs> right. Um, in 554 days, we looked that up first uh, appearance in a twins uniform in center field and it went fine. Uh, no, you know, wasn't, of not, not much of note that really <laughs> right. happened. Yeah. Uh, a couple balls that he didn't really have a chance to get to that right. he, you know, chased down after they landed and threw him back in. There was one kind of awkward play where he cut a ball off in the right center field gap and threw the ball in. And everybody in the press box, and I'm sure uh, in the dugout, was very much glued to him. Uh, eyeballs <laughs> right, yes. trying to read his body language and reaction to that, but he seemed okay. And then when we talked to him after the game, he was, again, as upbeat, continuing sort of a spring long trend with him, I would say. He's not, he's, I don't want to paint this wrong. Like, he's very much not an unpleasant person in general. <laughs> right. Yes, right. But right. because of the injuries that he's gone through for basically his entire career, 
And because of the fact that w when you're an often injured star player, the majority of your interactions with the media that cover you are going to be them asking you about your injury. Well, and then and on top he, of that, at, you're dealing with the pain of feeling like there's a knife in your well, knee right. every day as well. Like, and as so people ask you about of, your knee. <laughs> exactly. And you just get kind of beaten down by it. And unfortunately, so many of our interactions with him over the last several years have just been us asking him a question about his knee or his hip. Um and him basically just being tired of it. Like, yeah. I don't mean tired it, of the it, questions, it, it, but just, I mean, it is what it is. Was his, was yes, his or refrain, he would give me no again, comments right. a lot. There's right. no yeah. comment. I don't, I don't know. Uh, and yet, if you just casually talk to him, great guy, great personality, yes, right? Good sense of humor, beloved in that clubhouse, certainly. Right. And, but you can see why. Right. And so it's been nice. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago when he first reported to camp and was so upbeat and was so optimistic. And I know everyone has a level of, cynicism or skepticism sure. and that's that's warranted i'm not trying to like push you away from that but you know now he's actually appearing in some games he's he's hitting he's running he's throwing he's catching uh he looks good he certainly is moving in ways that he hasn't moved in a year and a half right just you know from the eye eyeball on it and he is not when, gutting his way through it anything <laughs> now right. he is just now we'll see playing, like yeah right how, how long that lasts but and you can see it in his face. You can see it in his his mannerisms, and you can certainly right. see it when we and hear it when we uh, gather on his locker and ask him questions because the, it's the same qu type of questions. It's <laughs> right. how's your knee feel questions, right. Yeah, right, right. but instead of trying to have to kind of uh, shield the real situation or just say I feel like crap or right. I wish I could be out there, right. he can say I feel great. Instead of and, it being a sad answer, it's right. a happy answer. <laughs> right, yeah. And so it's been great just from a, we've talked about this before, but just from a human being standpoint, uh, he's done nothing to deserve a career that continuously gets derailed by significant injuries. Yeah. Um, and do I think he's going to play 150 games this year in center field? No. Uh, I think it's going to be the same, right. you know, questions season long and career long at this point, which is how long can he stay healthy? How many days of rest does he need? And again, every time he dives for a ball or he uh, has to run full speed even, or has some right. sort of off slides in the second base. Of, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be, Oh no, here we go again. And that's, that's not going away. I mean, he's reached the point now with the person's career as a player that's never going away. Like he could have five fully healthy seasons. Right. And in the sixth season when he's, you know, 30 at the end of that contract, it would still be like, oh, let's see if Bucks can stay healthy. <laughs> yeah, and right. so you're not past that point. And the a person's demeanor and all that only takes you so far. But it's matched up with the fact that yeah. he just looks he looks spry. He looks I don't know, he's running oh, well. Oh, and we oh, saw that oh. early in camp. He they did like their little sprint drills. And he was so far ahead of everyone else, he did the Usain Bolt look behind as he <laughs> yeah, crossed yeah, yeah. the the finish line. So all, all off season we were kind of like hearing Hey, Buxton's looking a lot better. Buxton's looking a lot better, and there seemed to be some optimism around that, and you know, questions about whether or not they what they were going to do in center field, and you know, we were kind of wondering, like, what are, what are they seeing that is making them so optimistic about Byron Buxton? And I think the answer is what we have just seen for the last week and a half, which is just like. What mostly what they saw was he's just really excited to play baseball again, right? <laughs> right, and he's he's running around pain free, and he feels like he can do anything, and he's excited about playing. Like, I think, I think they saw nothing more than why he seems excited, and you can't help but not be excited for the guy who's excited. You yes. Know? Now, on one hand, I agree. Right. On one hand. If slash when he does have more health problems, that's right. going to be like even more uh, right. disheartening. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, look, he's coming back from a knee surgery this year or last year at this time. He was also coming back, from, back a from a knee surgery. surgery right? The difference is this was a different knee surgery. They removed the plica, which can be something that goes kind of undetected. It's like a, a flap in the knee. Please don't take our word for this. Like, look this up <laughs> if you're interested. Right. But my Ask understanding is Hafer. he knows all about this stuff. Ask literally anybody but a <laughs> communications or a you know journalism right. school dropout, that's right, that's right. and whatever the hell John's got it, it's a, some kind of <laughs> math degree. What is your actual degree? Just math? Math? Yeah, yeah. So he didn't know anything. And John's not even that good at math, so I don't know how that works. <laughs> um, don't ask us. But it's a different surgery. It's a surgery that at least theoretically, if they were correct about the problem, will 
alleviate the problem. Whereas last year's right. la- the last surgery that he entered spring training, it was immediately clear this hasn't done anything. Like this, he's as bad or worse. Now, right. you know, we'll see. It's very very early. We, like we said, there's a month before games start. Basically, he's I think could have a relatively light workload for a regular in spring training, but he will have a relatively heavy workload for Byron Buxton in spring yeah, training, right. which yeah, is right. kind of balancing that and. That changes everything for the Twins. I mean, that's right. been their hope. That was their hope last year. Is we'll work right. him back slowly. We'll have him in the DH spot early on. By June, May, June, July, whatever, right. he'll start to go mostly to center field. And then there we go. Well, it just never happened. And so we saw Michael A. Taylor be the center fielder for basically the whole time. Michael A. Taylor departed as a free agent. You know, I think having another center fielder kind of in insurance for Buxton was a priority this off season, but I think the payroll situation, which again, self-imposed all that, but when you're cutting 30 mil off the payroll, you can't just go give Michael A. Taylor 12 million bucks or whatever he wants or wanted at least. And so that's why the right-handed hitting outfielder slash center field backup, which ends up being the same guy in Manny Margot, which we'll talk about here dragged on for so long. Like, well, right. well, why couldn't you just re-sign Taylor or why couldn't you sign Harrison Bader or why couldn't you do Adam Duvall or Tommy Pham or whatever? Well, it took until now because I think the Twins felt like this is a role we need to fill. It's not necessarily a role we can fill with our number one target. And so right. they had to get creative. They had to wait out the market a little bit. I do think they were, we'll talk about this in a minute, but I do think they were continued to be in talks with Michael A. Taylor up until the last moment here is my understanding. Uh, yeah. what I was told, and what set this in motion was that Enrique Hernandez, another right-handed hitting outfielder, utility man, who's played most of his career with the Dodgers, remained unsigned, Right, and the Dodgers finally jumped in. The Dodgers, who, by the way, had Manuel Margot, they got him in the glass now trade as sort of a salary throw-in. They said, all right, well, we'll give you $4 million to Enrique Hernandez, and Enrique Hernandez at this late date, accepted it. Although he spent the last 48 hours giving interviews about right, right. collusion happening and <laughs> right. free agency being a sham and all this stuff. <laughs> um, but he's back with the Dodgers, and w- that's then set in motion the Dodgers having an extra right-handed hitting center fielder slash outfielder yeah. in Manuel Margot. And I don't think the Twins could have traded for uh, under with this monetary setup. The Twins could not have traded for Manuel Margot two months ago they could yeah. only do it once the dodgers brought in a guy who fits the same kind of profile or skill set yeah and I, I actually yeah i wonder a little bit about the timing on this as well like i i know that well we talked a little bit about michael taylor and you know he, he was asking for more money they couldn't come to an agreement etc that might be one of the reasons they were waiting i think one other one of the reasons they were waiting is that they know they only have so much money and they only have so many so many roster spots and they wanted to see if everybody in the in the rotation was healthy they wanted to see all this other stuff was healthy but when Enrique Hernandez decides he's signing with the Dodgers well at that point you either make that move with Margot or you have to wait go back into waiting mode on Taylor right. and or everybody else right i think that's right <clears throat> right and so i think you're right i i think what prompted this is I mean, we, we spent all of Friday, last the well, last free podcast, not all of it, but a chunk of it, talking about Enrique Hernandez and whether or not he was an option for the Twins and the fact that he was going to be making up his mind on, you know, Monday of next week and the Twins were one of the four finalists, et cetera. And then, you know, on Monday, sure enough, he does sign with not one of the four finalists, but whatever, yes. <laughs> right? Or he, he's going to that, sign with them. And and I don't, I would be interested in finding out whether or not the Twins called the Dodgers or the Dodgers called the Twins with we got an extra guy now. Like we're gonna, we're yeah. gonna we, we'd rather have similar to how Enrique and Hernandez didn't make sense for the Twins. No, I'm not gonna say didn't make sense, but was a less good fit for that last roster spot for the Twins uh, because they kind of needed an outfielder more than they needed an infielder. Yeah, they needed his value. He can play anywhere theoretically, and five years ago he legitimately could play right. everywhere. But he's sure. like 33 now, and he hasn't been that in, good. In, well, first in of all. He just hasn't been that good for a couple of years now, but and he's been injured. Right. He's not a guy you're going to really want to play at shortstop. He's not a guy you're going to really want to play regularly in center field. And so the Twins needed what whoever this final roster spot was. They needed it to be a right-handed right. bat. They needed it to hit left-handed pitching, which he does, and he can play the outfield. But ultimately, the reason they traded for Margot 
instead of trying to sign Duvall or Fam or, or someone like that, or trade for they, a right hip cor- a right. slugging corner, yeah, yeah, is they decided the center field aspect of that was as important or potentially more important than the just right-handed slugger corner bat right, aspect yeah. of it. And yeah. Margot can fill both roles. He checks both boxes, you know, two birds, one roster spot, basically. But he's certainly a uh, defense and speed and center field coverage is number one on that list. And, you know, being pretty good against left-handed pitching and being able to play left or right field, which he did quite a bit for the Rays. I mean, certainly. Um, and he's a really good defender there, too, so that shouldn't be overlooked. Uh, yeah. That's a, important, but it's secondary on the list. So before we talk about Manuel Man. Margot and the <laughs> roster fit Introduce you to Manny stuff. Margot. Let's talk a little bit about baseball is back. Baseball season is here, and that means your fantasy baseball team is back. And there is no better tool for fantasy baseball than RotoWire. And, in fact, I mean, frankly, it's a great tool just if you like baseball. Like Yes, and We've both you, used it for years just with baseball writing because yes. one of the beautiful parts about it is they have a database of injury news and just player news right. going back decades. And so if you say to yourself, right. hey, I'm writing about Byron Buxton, when was he hurt? Well, yeah. when wasn't he hurt? But when was he hurt and when did he go on the I.O. and how or, long was he or, out? Or like you're like, or like you're like me and you're like, Manny Margot was who again now? It right. was one you of those can guys go back Tampa, right? And you can kind of get a step-by-step. <laughs> Uh, right, I don't know, time capsule almost right. of their career well, not with a, sourcing and yeah. quotes and dates and all that. And that's essential, one of uh, my, not only for fantasy, but for writing and just being a fan right. of, of baseball. One of and my favorite wire has that better than anybody. One of my favorite things about it is, is like they have the breakdown in news, like the, you know, an update. Every time there's a news article about this person, they've got a link to it, et cetera. Right? But they also have like a yearly capsule at the beginning of each of them that you can kind of go through. So you can start with, oh, Manny Margot was drafted this time. And then, you know, here's how he did in double A. And here's how he did, uh, uh, you know, his, he was a top 25 prospect at one point and blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, and you can kind of see the arc of their career and where they went. It's fantastic. And I mean, and, they also base fantasy baseball stuff too. Like yes, you, you want can... to get prepared for your draft. You want to prepare for your auction. They've got all the cheat sheets. They know they've got totally rebuilt their Also, if you like do, do daily fantasy stuff, they've totally built up this thing called the lineup optimizer. And you just go in there and you they have a new picks tool and it helps people who play fantasy pick them games, pick like uh, prize picks and underdogs play their games. It's fantastic. And here's the offer they have for our listeners. You can get a totally free trial to RotoWare for two full days. And when I say totally free, I mean it. You don't even have to give them a credit card. It's not one of those two days free and then it kicks in at a million dollars. Uh, it's totally free because here's the thing. They're confident that if you try their product and you look around a little bit, you look around the store a little bit, you're going to realize that it's a superior product and you're going to want to use it for all your drafts and you're going to want to use it just to watch sports and be up to date on news and and injuries and stuff. And it's also, if you just have a draft coming up and you want to use it for that draft and figure out the two days and do it, that's fine too. It's also Uh, in your free trial. It's not just baseball. You know, it's also yes. football and everything. So you get you get that one year subscription to it. You get you're set for your fantasy football stuff forever. So too. here's where you go. Again, you don't even need a credit card re- uh, required for the two day free trial. You go to rotowire dot com slash gleeman. That's R O T O W I R E rotowire dot com slash gleeman. No credit card required for the totally free trial for two days. Sign up. We've been using it both of us for a very long time. Uh, our next sponsor is factor yeah we had tra- we had a little bit of a tragedy with factor it, their shipment to us came like two days before we were leaving for florida and their 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 stuff is fresh never frozen right so i got like one meal in of the that we got and my daughter's getting the rest of them oh Which what a tragedy <laughs> you've given your firstborn <laughs> free meals well they're good here's the thing about the fact oh meals. even <laughs> worse you've given your firstborn <laughs> child good meals they're healthy they're oh, good no. they're really simple to make sure you just pop them in the microwave uh i we had the the butter chicken the last time i had a tuscan thing uh just before we left it's really good stuff uh and they've got like 35 different options to choose from every week including like Cal- it, I, by healthy, I mean like your choices are calorie smart or protein plus or keto. Like this is not, you know, this is not just 
crap that you're putting in your body that you're getting from, right. you know, DoorDash. The idea is kind of <laughs> restaurant quality meals pre-made, sent to you, like like you said, fresh. Right. Uh, and you just heat them up. That's it. Yeah. Uh, even, you know, it's perfect for a guy like me. I don't know what I'm doing yeah. in the in the kitchen, <laughs> but they're good. Uh, you can go to factormeals.com slash Gleeman50, 50 uh, and use the code Gleeman50. It's all one and the reason, yeah. And the reason it's 50 is you get 50% off. Right. So that's factor, F-A-C-T-O-R, meals.com, factormeals.com slash Gleeman50. And you get 50% off. That's factormeals.com slash Gleeman50 to get your 50% off. Pick uh, the meals you want sent right to you. You heat them up. You eat them. They're good. And maybe if you have children, you can <laughs> let them eat a few of the meals too. For I don't free know. Because, you know, kids need meals. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. You're not going to win father a year based on that. You're so yeah. upset that you're giving Elise some <laughs> meals. Dude. Think all the... I've got joy I've she's that, brought I've to your given, life. I've given that kid plenty of meals in my lifetime. I wanted those for myself. <laughs> okay. Well, boy, we really learned something about John Bonus here. <laughs> I feel like I treat my cats better than you treat your kids at this point. <laughs> but, uh, okay. So let's talk a little bit about Manuel. And here's the thing I had heard, as I said on the last show. Oh, yeah. That he prefers the, not the last to be... show, by the way, meaning patreon.com slash Gleam, yes. not the free one where we broke this trade down immediately after it happened the very next morning. So, yes, we went uh, really in depth on this trade and the roster right. and some of the, you know, the behind the scenes stuff that we had learned. P A T R E O N, patreon.com slash Gleam, and get that a whole archive is free when you sign up. So, we would love to have you join us. Perfect time to join. As we ramp up for the season, you know, you, oh. you're going to want to listen during the season. Right. So you might as well sign up for the last few weeks of spring training. But I had heard that in Tampa Bay, he preferred not to be called Manny. And so I was like, okay, that's fine. We always try to learn that stuff. Sure. So, like, you don't walk up and go Manny and have him go, oh, F off or whatever. Uh, so we go up to him whatever day he got here. Here's the thing about it, Margot. He was scratched from the right. Dodgers lineup. They were in in Arizona. They were playing the Rockies, I want to say, on the road. So it wasn't even a Dodgers home game. Right. And he was in the lineup in center field that day for like a you know noon or a one o'clock game West Coast time. He was scratched from the lineup and then traded to the Twins and immediately drove like an hour to the condo he'd been staying at, packed up all his stuff, hopped on a red eye flight. Right. And got to twin spring training like basically two days before he would have needed to. Right. Uh, the, next, the next morning he was there. The, right. In the morning. Right. It walked in. They had him. We saw a video of him coming in the parking lot. So then we talked to him the next day, the next morning, right. when he was fully in uniform and going through workouts and all that stuff. Uh, and the very first thing, I forget who said it. We always say this when somebody new comes in. Do you, What do you prefer to be called? Uh and he said, oh, I don't know, man. Man, he's fine. And I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> Fake news. You can't believe anything you read these days on Twitter or <laughs> on X. Or listen to podcast. Well, that we know is certain, <laughs> especially this podcast. Anyway, Manny Margot, Manuel Margot. Um, so here's a few of the details from the trade. Like we said, it, it, it all kind of was set in motion by Enrique Hernandez returning to the Dodgers where he's won a World Series and played like, I don't know six of the last eight seasons basically he ended last season with the Dodgers after a little stint with the Red Sox that didn't go that well. Um, he gets a one year, $4 million deal. The Dodgers basically choose him over Margot to fill that last bench spot, that right-handed hitting, you know, versatile uh, in, in, in uh, Hernandez's case, he can play everywhere in Margot's case. He can play the three outfield spots, but right. that then allows them to trade Margot to the twins the problem being he's got a $10 million salary for this season and an option for next season that has a $2 million buyout and a $12 million right. option. And we know the twins don't have that kind of money because if they had that kind of money, <laughs> right, Michael yeah, Taylor right. would probably be their backup center fielder right now. Right. Uh, but much like the Polanco trade where the Mariners included money to pay 60% of Anthony D. Sclafani's $10 million contract, the specifics of this trade included money to pay down 60% of Manuel Margot's $10 million contract so that it becomes essentially a one-year $4 million deal 
from the twin standpoint. And then the other thing is if slash when they end up declining his 2025 option, which is $12 million, that will also be covered by the Dodgers slash raise. So the, the most the twins can pay here is 4 million bucks unless they pick up his option for 12 million, but right. that's their choice. I mean, that's pretty right. unlikely I would say. So a one year, $4 million deal. It's similar to the D Scalfani conversation we had, what right. a month and a half ago. Is he the guy you would have targeted at the top of your trade list to be the fourth outfielder or in D Scalfani's case, the fifth starting pitcher? Well, no, I mean, no, we, we would have, Gone no. after Michael A. Taylor or Kevin probably. Kiermaier or yes. Harrison Bader or whoever. And in Di Scalfani's case, he wouldn't have even probably been right. in my top five. Uh, but at the one year, $4 million price range, there's not going to be anybody but it, better than Manuel Margot that you're going to be able to get. I mean, right. we saw, well, I mean, we know Michael A. Taylor is not available at that money. I can tell you, right. I heard from multiple twin sources, and I'm sure John has heard similar, that they've been talking to Taylor since November on and yeah. off. Um, you know, they wanted him back. He liked it here in Minnesota. Yeah. Uh, it was certainly a good fit, obviously, on the field. I mean, perfect fit. And they relatively recently, I was told, kind of went to him and said, all right, well, we got to, f- we need, whoever this is going to be, we need him here. Right. So here's our offer. And I don't know how much better it was than the offer two months ago or worse or whatever. Uh, and he said no. And I think their feeling at that point, was this isn't we're the bridge is too far to yeah. you know it's it's, yeah. it's the, the, we're too far apart here so if you have to have you want this guy in camp whoever's going to fill this role which is an important role because it's going to play right. even if buxton is healthy you know for by his standards this role is going to get 300 400 at bats minimally i mean right. i think and so it's a role they want in camp so that this person, and if Buxton's not healthy, this guy's going to play every day, basically. Yeah. And so once Taylor is out of their price range, and again, I'm not saying Taylor isn't righteous in saying sure. he wants more right. than whatever yeah, they right. offered. I, mean, I don't know had, what we, they offered. We, we had Taylor uh, scheduled. I mean, we, we were debating at the beginning of this offseason whether or not Taylor was worth a two-year, $20 million contract, right? And this was going to be, I mean, yeah. at the time we were like, I think he's probably a 110 guy. Yes. But, you know, he could get 220. Like there was a, we both thought Kiermaier would probably get 220. Yep. Uh, you know, Kiermaier got 110.5. Bader, who we thought was worse than Taylor, got 110.5, right? And so, you know, if you're Taylor, you either have to come to the recognition that you've overplayed the market or, you know, and, you know, sign for less at this point, as you take a look at the realistic options that are out there. Now, maybe, you know, maybe Taylor was thinking, you know, I, you know, you're going to have this problem every year. You know, maybe we just signed me to a two-year deal for, you know, $12 million or something. Yeah, like. You didn't get a two-year deal. Right. No, exactly. Right. I mean, I, I don't know exactly where it all broke down. I don't, I mean, I, I think that, I have that same process with a lot of the free agents that are out there right now, right? I mean, whether it's Fam or it's um, Duvall or Taylor or a lot of the pitchers that are out there that I think they're, they're sitting there waiting for an offer that is unlikely to come at this point. Well, yeah, I think I agree. And I think it's we got to be careful not to paint this as a criticism of the players necessarily right. because I think the circumstances are pretty clear, especially for like the Blake Snells and the uh, Montgomery's and the Matt Chapman's and even to some extent those guys that you just mentioned the outfielders because like a third of the league basically including the twins has either halted all spending right. or reduced spending by a significant amount yeah and you do that you know across eight or ten teams and we see with the twins they're dropping 30 million in payroll right. not every team is doing that obviously but you start to do that across ten teams you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars in sort of unspent money that you normally would have been spent in a typical off season. Well, you can kind of do the math on that. Like if right. 10 teams kind of halted spending and half of those are like the twins have dropped it by 20 million, you know, you throw like the Padres dropped it by like 50 or 70 million or something. Um, well, that's right. Montgomery's money, Snell's money and Chapman's money, right. basically, yeah. Right. Yeah. you know, right. two, $300 million there. Yeah. Uh, and it, it then apply, you know, there's a trickle down effect or whatever that applies to guys like Taylor. And so, I'm very curious to see what Taylor and Duvall and Fam and some of the other guys who are still available end up signing for. It may 
turn out that Taylor was justified at every level in not accepting whatever the Twins' sure. last offer was because maybe he gets $8 million a week from now, right. in which yes. case I can tell you the Twins were not going to give him $8 million. Mm. I think it's it's tricky to – I think a lot of people, particularly because of the Boris uh, component, he's not Taylor's rep, but he reps most of the high-profile right. reagents who are left. They want it to go badly for Boris, I feel like, across baseball. Uh, maybe. And so you want to sort of assign blame or like embarrassment sure, sure, sure. to those guys. And maybe that's the case. Maybe Cody Bellinger or whoever turned down some much bigger deal at some point and then had to settle and he feels bad about that. That's fine. But in Taylor's case, I, it's not, I don't know that he misread the market. I mean, first of all, we got to see what he ends up signing for. Maybe right. he just yeah, true. Yep. needs to wait it out. But like, yeah, he's worth ten million if Kiermeyer and Bader are getting ten million, or he's worth eight million at least right. in that case. No, you're right. And I think what you have to factor in in this specific situation with the Twins and Michael A. Taylor or Fam or Duvall or whoever, they just didn't have that much money, and it like them not having eight million dollars to give to Michael A. Taylor, them choosing not to have eight million dollars hey, to, to give say, to yeah, Michael. Right, a. Okay, fair. they got that much money, believe me. Right. Yes. But you know what I mean. Yes. It's not a mark against Michael A. Taylor. Right. No, you know, I agree. Like, if the Twins had a better TV situation or an ownership group that was willing to just invest in the team and not, you know, right. have to do profits and losses the way they're doing, they'd have given Michael A. Taylor $8 million bucks or $10 million bucks three months ago, and we wouldn't be having this conversation. And so it's not Michael A. Taylor's fault that the Twins are in a position where they're having to look to their second third fourth fifth options or having to work out trades with the dodgers but I, to get also, cash considerations in the deal just to not resign a very obvious you know just just bring back michael a taylor i think they would have liked to do that i think the front office would have liked to do that and they could have done it a month or two ago they certainly could have done it a week ago but instead it's four million dollars that they have to invest in this role roughly and i certainly don't think michael a taylor was ever going to sign with the tw- resign with the twins for four million or five million dollars now we'll right. see i mean if he ends up signing somewhere for 3.5 million two weeks right, from now yeah, right, right. that's a much different situation but we're also talking about it as if uh you know margot is a significant downgrade for michael a taylor and i don't think he is necessarily a right significant downgrade he's different like yeah. stylistically they're much different and we're, we're gonna get into that now but from a what like what sort of value would you project from this role in 2024 you got to remember that couple things about taylor one he's 33 years old that's an age at which you can never be assured that speed and defense sure. will continue and without decline it has so far i mean he's already kind of beaten father time a little bit yeah here, but uh margot's 29 i think he's like three and a half four years younger than him but then beyond that yeah michael a. taylor popped 20 homers last year and he played great defense that made him a perfect fit in that role once buxton was out of the picture well 20 homers was a career high and even with the 20 homers, he had a 270 something on base percentage, which is terrible. Right. He hit 220. He struck out a ton. I think he had the seventh highest strikeout rate in the league. He doesn't walk much. His overall value is much less than the 20 homer center fielder. Like you hear, ooh, 20 homer, good defensive center fielder. You think Torrey Hunter or something like that. Right. Well, he was on the lower end of that because he doesn't draw well. Walks, he makes a lot of outs, all that stuff. He had like a 94 OPS plus, which is always compared to 100 as league average. So that means he was like 6% worse than league average. Well, Manuel Margot, well, he doesn't have nearly that much power. I mean, he might not hit 20 homers in three seasons. Right. Has a 97 OPS plus over the last three years and has been above 90 each of the last four years for the Rays. Michael A. Taylor was above 90 once in the last six years and it was last season and it was barely above 90. And so I think defensively, Michael A. Taylor was much better than Margot last season, uh, in part because Manuel Margot had some injuries last season. But he's been a, Margot's been a really good defender. Right. I mean, I, I I would put him in the very good range, not the great range that I would maybe put Taylor in. But if you're projecting just for this season, a 33 year old Taylor and a 29 year old Margot probably project roughly as equals defensively. I think so. I think so. And so. Then it's, well, what's the offense? Well, it depends what you want. Do you want power with bad on base skills and a lot of strikeouts, which is Taylor? Or do you want a whole lot less power with some better contact skills? Margot struck out literally half as often as Taylor last season. Right. And that was pretty typical. He, he's going to be more of a, you know, you hit 265, 270. You got, you know, five to 10 homers if you put him in a regular role. He's going to steal a few bases. He's not going to strike strike out much he's going to draw some walks he's going to hit some doubles he's more of just sort of a middle of the road guy whereas taylor was boomer bust taylor mm-hmm. was 
high end speed in the outfield, hit a bunch of 440 foot homers, and then would have series where he was one for 12 with 10 strikeouts or whatever. And I'm not denigrating Taylor. I mean, that made him a really good low end starter or, you know, insurance policy for, for Buxton. But just because they're different stylistically doesn't mean that the, Taylor was better suited for that role or likely to be more valuable in that role. And honestly, I think if you just said to me, make a list of five guys for a fourth outfielder, you know, backup center fielder uh, for an off injured Buxton and somebody who can platoon in the corners, uh, I'd have put these guys in basically the same range. Like they would have been in there with, you know, two or three other guys. And if you can get one of them for 4 million and the other one has turned down your offers for who knows what, at some point, you just have to do that. It's unfortunate that the payroll situation has made it so that the Twins haven't been able to make their sort of first choice moves this offseason. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that their second or third choice or create creative moves won't work out well or or even better. So I think that's kind of the situation with Taylor or Margot. But again, I want to see what Taylor actually signs for. Yeah, I do too. I, do I too. mean, if he signs for $2 million, then yeah, he. Well, I also wanted. I, I'm he also excited just to see what Margot's game looks like. You know, Taylor did do a lot of other little things, whether it was bunting or just. I mean, For he sure. seemed to play. He played. He played the game in a lot of smart ways beyond the numbers that he put up. Agreed. And I, and I mean, in in the way that you would hope a veteran would do, and he did it right. Um, but you know, he, he also like I. He had back problems, which you'd expect a 33 year old baseball player to be having. You know, there were times that he wasn't available. I'm sure Margot has got to overcome some of the injury issues he had. We should mention he had, you know, a couple of different. I think it was a last year was the lower leg injuries, or is two years ago were the lower bones, leg injuries? Bone spurs was last bones, year. Or, okay, bone spurs was last year, right? Yeah, the, yeah elbow yes. bone spurs. And he says he's fully right. healthy for whatever that's worth. Yeah, and uh, the twins were asked, or Derek Falvey was asked in our press conference with him, you know, how do you know how healthy he is? Has he gotten past the injury problems he had last year? And one of the answers was, well, he's been working out with Willie Castro, and he's been working out with uh, Carlos Santana, and yeah, we had plenty of reports on him prior to exploring this trade with the Dodgers. So, And by the way, he's been playing in games with the Dodgers. Right. Yeah. Well, that's true too. Right. He was. Right. If this trade would have happened three hours later, he'd have played in center field for the Dodgers right. that day, that's or right. an hour later, even. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about Margot. You know, I think if you've watched playoff baseball uh, over the last five to seven years, you've probably seen him uh, with the Rays. He was kind of the similar role that Taylor filled for the Twins last year—a very high-end backup or a right. low-end starter for the Rays. Uh, they had Kiermaier in center, but Kiermaier missed some time over the years with injuries, in which case Margot would step in as the primary center fielder. When Kiermaier was healthy, uh, they would often play Margot in right field, where he has a pretty good arm and great range, yeah. uh, and he put up great numbers there. He put up good numbers in center, too, uh, for the most part. I think he's probably going to play a little bit more left field for the Twins than he did for the Rays, just because the Twins have Kepler as the starter in, in right field. Sure. If Kepler's out, they might play Walner some in right field. But it's also worth noting that he's got a good enough arm for right field. It's for not sure. like he's limited to left field like some of the other outfielders are. He played the second most starts that he had for the race was in right field. So Yes. As no, he's a legit field. center fielder who can play both corner spots, has hundreds of innings in both corner spots. Uh, he's a really good defender, particularly if last season's uh, injuries kind of affected the so-so numbers he had. We'll see. I mean, he's also 29. Right, yeah. That's an age where things start to decline from a athleticism and, and speed standpoint. Um, so if things go well with Buxton, you're going to see Margot start occasionally in center field, you know, every third or fourth game, something like that. And then when a lefty is on the mound, he would be alongside Buxton, either in left field or right field. And that's, you know, another two, two, three starts a week. It depends. I mean, obviously it depends who you're facing. It's kind of, you're kind of at the mercy of your opponent's rotation at that point. But, you know, you add that up a couple starts a week in center, a couple starts a week in left or right against the lefty. That's four starts every, you know, six or seven games. That's, you know, 400 at bats, something like that. I think that's what they would envision for him. That's what they envisioned for Michael Taylor last year, by the way. And then Buxton was so out of the picture in center that Taylor just played 100, I don't know, 110 games in center. And he, I don't think he ever played a corner spot for the Twins, right? I mean, why would he have? Yeah, I know. Uh, Because Buxton was never in center. So, yeah, that's right. That's the, it's the same role filled by the same type of player, but much different stylistically. And 
you know, you look at Margot's numbers against lefties, pretty good, not great. And that's what we talked about leading up to this is, you know, it's pretty obvious that this last bench spot, this fourth bench spot, the 13th position player was going to have to be, I mean, we talked about it going back to, well, we got Nick Gordon there by default on roster projections. Well, it ain't going to be Nick Gordon because he's a lefty. How does right. that help? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they trade Gordon for Stephen Okert. And then it makes it very obvious. And so then we start going down the list of names. Adam Duvall, Tommy Pham, Randall Gritchick, Michael A. Taylor, on and on, free agents mostly. And the question we had was, are they going to try to focus that role, that backup right-handed hitting outfielder, are they going to place more emphasis on the bat and go for like a Duvall who's got 30 homer type of power or Tommy Pham who's been like a 800 OPS type of guy for a lot of a lot of good teams? Or are they going to place more emphasis on the Buxton insurance backup center field, you know, can be a legit defensive center fielder aspect, in which case, well, it would have to be Michael A. Taylor if it's a free agent. There were no other free agents. It turns out they placed more of an emphasis, I think, on center field, Yeah, which leads them to Margot in trade. And he does check the box of – he definitely checks the center field box. I mean, I would say – He's certainly one of the 30 best center fielders in Major League Baseball. Like, if you oh, just right. distributed all players and you started at, in center field and you distribute them to new teams in order of how good they are, he's going to get distributed like 25th out of center field or something like that, Um, which is kind of similar to Taylor. If you don't want him starting 150 games in center field, but if you need that, he can, he can be a decent starting caliber guy. Then the question is, well, how – how much of a downgrade from the bigger, like the true big bat left field, right field guys is he? And I mean, I think he's certainly a worse hitter than Tommy Pham or Duvall or Grichik <laughs> sure. or whoever it is. But if you're starting him really only against lefties in that role, right? he's got pretty consistently, he's hit like 280, 290 against lefties. He draws some walks. So his on base percentage is like 340, 350. The power is not there. I mean, Adam Duvall could hit more homers in a month facing lefties than Margot would hit in a season. Um, but you also got to remember that he's got good speed and he plays great defense in a corner yeah, spot. Yeah. He's certainly going to be a better defender than those guys. And I just think ultimately the twins kind of decided, yes, it would be great to have the biggest possible bat to stick in the lineup against lefties. And if we were building kind of a fantasy baseball team, that's what we would go for. Except the moment Buxton is not available in center field, and that's almost surely going to happen at some right. point. Then it's like, well, who's playing center field? Well, Willie Castro. I don't think they right. want to play Willie. We've talked about this all offseason. Yeah. Willie Castro's yeah. a lot of things. A guy who's going to start 100 games for a good team in center field, at least the Twins, is not one of them. And so it was like, well, okay, we could sign Adam Duvall, although he might cost too much by their standards. We'll, well see how much he's yeah. But also, like, are we ever going to play Adam Duvall in center field? No. So yeah. then yeah. – have Adam Duvall's bigger bat in left field requires playing Willie Castro in center field, so you've downgraded defensively yeah. there. And so I think they felt like Margot was kind of the best blend of the two, and I I agree with that. But I also think the money was a factor. Yeah, I mean they might have they might have uh, you know sacrificed a little bit of ceiling for a little bit of floor. You know they they are they're covering their risk in terms of the center field situation. Right. Yeah. Like you said, and, and, and before that they might be sacrificing a slightly better bat in right field or right or left field or corner outfield things. I, I'll also say this. He's got a, they've got a lot of guys that can hit, hit the ball a long ways, right? We, we, this, this team has not had any problems with people hitting the ball a long ways. Uh, it's interesting that they were like, well, you know what, let's bring in a speed and speed and defense guy, especially a guy that gets on base versus right-handed, Right-handed people and see what left-handed see what, people. I'm versus left-handed people and see see what happens there. I, I mean, Rocco actually talked openly uh, the day before. He was not talking about Margot, but he was talking about Austin Martin. He was asked about Austin Martin by one of the beat reporters and basically said, "Listen, if you're trying to design a guy that's a really good fit for our roster, you know who's a really good fit for our roster? A guy who can play center field. He can get himself on base. He can run around. He can create a lot of things." He can create some situations when he's on the base pass and he can, he bats right-handed. Like that's, that's the kind of player that we need on this, that that's right. we have left on this roster to try and do. And then the next day they went and traded for Margot who checks all those boxes. Yeah. I mean, I think, look, we, or I, 
I'll just throw myself under this bus. Like I'm the first one to say that strikeouts are just outs, right? I mean, we talk about that all the time. We we were at the media luncheon in uh, what December? <laughs> yeah. No, January. Yeah. And uh, we talked. We joked about this already. Chip Scoggins yeah, from the yeah. Strib said something to Falvey about. Can you tell me like, like why it is? Can you do a quick explainer to me why it is you guys don't care about strikeouts for hitters? <laughs> and Falvey said, "Ask Gleeman. He can tell you." <laughs> As like Gleeman's been ranting about this for ten years, yeah. and it's true, but adding a more more diversity to a lineup in terms of skill sets or player profiles is not a bad thing. And to go from Michael A. Taylor, who struck out like 34% of the time last year and throughout his career, to Manny Margot, who struck out like 16% of the time last year. That's stylistically, it's just going to allow you to do different things, not better things or more productive things, just different things. You get to the bottom of the lineup, and with Taylor, you were waiting for him to hit a 400-foot homer. That was his value. Now it might just be Manny Margot going the opposite way for a single or something like that. You were also, you know, you're replacing Gallo, essentially, at least in terms of the opening day roster last year, with Carlos Santana. Right. Well, again, you're replacing the literal highest strikeout rate ever in Joey Gallo. Right. With Carlos Santana, who he might look like a high strikeout guy, but he's one of the lower strikeout guys and always had a great strikeout to walk ratio. And so you're, you're, Look, they still got guys who are going to strike out. Byron Buxton strikes sure. out a ton. Right. Eddie Julian, Matt Walner, they're going to strike out plenty. But to take two of your higher strikeout rate guys from last year in Gallo and Taylor and replace them with two guys who have been throughout their careers known for bat-to-ball skills and, and controlling the strike zone and all that stuff, it's, it, it adds different dimensions to a lineup. Not better or worse, but different. And so I think that's part of it, too. I'm sure they don't mind doing that. I mean, all things being equal. If you tell me you got a guy with an 800 OPS, do you want the guy who strikes out a ton or do you want the guy who strikes out not at all? Well, I'll, I'll take the low strikeout guy, all all things being equal. So that's part of it. I think, you know, he's not an 850 OPS, you know, masher sure. against lefties. He's more of a 789 type of hitter. Um, but again, that's where Taylor batted for the Twins too. Uh, let's see. There's a few other things. But first, yeah, let's talk about our, our last sponsor here. Uh, BetterHelp, BetterHelp.com. You've, uh, we've talked a lot about the challenges you can have when you are seeking therapy, and that's one of the reasons why we enjoy or recommend BetterHelp is because it gets you past all of the obstacles that happen after you get past the biggest obstacle, which is just saying to yourself, hey, I need to talk to somebody, or we need to talk to somebody, right? Uh, you know, you, you can come to that realization, and that's a great big step forward, but then you're Faced with all the little steps, like who, who, like how do I get a recommendation? Uh, what, when do we meet? How do we meet? What, uh, what happens if they're full up? How much is it going to cost? Well, BetterHelp helps with all of that stuff. Yes, and they can set it up. If you want to do a video chat, you do a video chat. If you don't want to be on camera, you do a phone call. If you don't want to be on the phone, I hate being on the phone. You can just do a live chat. <laughs> right. They'll they'll tailor it to whatever you're comfortable with, because uh, that's the whole goal. And if you go to BetterHelp dot com slash gleeman you can get 10 percent off your first month that's better help h-e-l-p better com slash gleeman and uh yeah whatever you've been thinking about talking to someone about this is a good opportunity uh to try it without some of the barriers for entry that's right uh, that you typically might face better com slash gleeman okay um let's see on margot he seemed uh he seems very well liked I will say like his reputation. He's played for a lot of winning teams uh, with the Rays and he's been a high end role player because the Rays are filled with high end role players. That's sort of their thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Their th- I mean, honestly, their thing is sort of how do you get Michael Taylor production from a guy who isn't Michael Taylor? That's right. kind of yeah. what the Rays do. How do we fill a 20 homer role with a guy whose overall contributions can be similar to that, but who doesn't hop off the page with 20 homers and is thus, cheaper and easier to acquire because that's all the Rays do. Basically. It also surprises me a little bit that they signed him to the contract. It, it was a to. weird contract because they don't have any money. <laughs> right, um, right. And they almost immediately were looking to trade him. Right. Yeah, I don't I don't really know. Uh, it's it's strange. Uh, the, yeah, his contract itself is, is just odd, but it, I guess, played to the Twins' benefit. It's a one-year, $4 million deal for the Twins, which if they had just signed Manuel Margot a month ago for one-year, $4 million, we would have said, oh, great value signing. Fills the role, right. 
et cetera, et cetera. Well, you don't see uh, a lot. Of, you don't see the Rays make a lot of trades where they include money. And they, and they uh, they were the ones who included right. money when they traded him to the Dodgers. So. True. Although, Although they, were they also- shed like 25 right. mil with glass now. <laughs> glass but yes, they did include That's a little right, bit yeah. of money, 4 million or something like that. Uh, and like we said at the beginning, this basically locks in the hitter half or the position player yeah. half of the roster. Right. I mean, look, injuries can happen. Obviously, Buxton especially is something to watch in terms of his availability. But it's one of those, if the season started today, I feel very confident that we could tell you 13 out of 13 position players. Yeah. Uh, and we can we can run through them if you want. But it's going to be your starting lineup. Uh, well, assuming you're facing a righty on opening day, which I don't know. They have a lefty in the rotation for Kansas City. But let's just play along here <laughs> okay. and say they're facing a righty on March 28th in Kansas City. You're going to have Jeffers behind the plate. You're going to probably have Carlos Santana at first base, Eddie Julian at second base, Carlos Correa at short, Royce Lewis at third, Matty Walner in left, Byron Buxton, uh, knock on wood, Byron Buxton in center, Max Kepler in right, and then I would guess Alex Kirilov at DH. That's going to be your starting nine. Right. That leaves four spots on the bench because you're going to have 13 position players on a 26-man roster. Well, one of them's the backup catcher, so that's Vasquez. One of them is the backup shortstop, and that's Kyle Farmer. And he's also probably going to platoon with Ed Julian at second base. Uh, one of them is Willie Castro, who until a week ago was their backup center fielder, which right. I know they didn't feel the most confident about. And then the other one is Manuel Margot. Right. And because Manuel yeah. Margot can cover all three outfield spots very well, that frees up Willie Castro to fill more of the role that he thrived in last season, which is a true bounce around utility guy. Not, oh, I'm playing center field for the next three weeks. It's I'm playing third base today and left field tomorrow and center field the next day and on and on. And he can pinch run. He can pinch hit. He can be a right-handed bat. He's a switch hitter in left field or right field. They could trot out, let's say, a lineup against lefties that has Castro in left, Buxton in center, Margot in right. And that would be phenomenal defensively and pretty good offensively against lefties. So that's what they could go for. So. That's your position players. Now, it's bad news for, like, Austin Martin or Trevor Larnick. <laughs> right, yes. Right. Uh, or, and it's why Gordon got traded, and, and right. bad news probably for Jose Miranda and right. guys like that. Brooks Lee, obviously, those guys are almost assured, all of them, of starting the year in the at AAA. But that's what the Twins wanted. I mean, we saw right. that last yeah. offseason. I mean, they want it, the first line right. of defense from a depth standpoint to be veterans. Well, and it also helps if they've got... You know they've got uh, some sort of injury that they deal with. They they don't want they don't want they don't want one of their prospects playing every other day in the majors. Uh, at you know if if everybody's healthy, right? This way, if somebody gets injured for a while, well then great, we call up the prospect to play for two weeks. You know while they're on the while they're on the IL, right? If it's just sort of like ah, you know Max Kepler's uh, banged up a little bit. He's got a sore toe for three days. Uh, well, now, now you've got the bench depth to be able to handle that with a with a veteran replacement. So. Yeah, I mean, it's not that Brooks Lee couldn't do the job of Kyle Farmer or that Austin right. Martin couldn't do the job of Manuel Margot. They could potentially. Right. It's less certain as rookies, but they could potentially. It's that, yeah, to your point, Margot and Farmer are very comfortable with and are being well compensated for their ability to play well in a 300 at bat role or a 400 at bat role. Well, you don't want to put a 24 year old prospect in that role you want them playing every day so that's kind of how i would differentiate it um here's one other man margot fact and then we'll move on to the last bit of news and notes here do you know for whom he was traded uh from san diego he was initially signed by boston uh as a teenager internationally okay. traded to san diego in the craig kimbrell trade many many moons ago then played three years i think for san diego as you know part-time or pretty solid player Traded then from San Diego to Tampa Bay for a very uh, familiar name. I would call them an old friend, although they might disagree. I did. I uh, saw this a couple of days ago. Yeah. I was traded for. Emilio. Emilio Pagan. Yeah. It's yeah. fun. It's a fun little uh, trade tree there. So <laughs> uh, that's Manny Margot. If you want even more than that on Manuel Margot, we did a whole Patreon kind of emergency right. or as we call it now urgent care not emergency yeah, that's right yeah <laughs> we've uh, got we've got two different levels over on the patreon we get the emergency which is like trading away polanco and then we've got the uh you know bench player pickup or the waiver claim or some other uh, move that they have we now have 
urgent care, complete with its own urgent care music, which is fantastic. A little bossa nova. Yeah, I would say we're at the point where it's all. It's worth subscribing to the Patreon as much for the music <laughs> uh, for as sure. for the, the baseball content. They're probably running equal there in that race. Yeah. Because, right. um, you know, we are who we are, but actual musicians. So, uh, okay. So let's run through a couple other, like, some pitching notes here. Uh, and then we'll talk about Denard Span at the very end. Too. I don't yeah, know that right. we have a ton to add about that. But uh, let's see. From a pitching standpoint, just these are more news and notes here. But Varl- Louis Varland... And Chris Paddock are both working on sliders, new-ish, let's call them sliders. Yeah. And Varlin is working on a sinker, too. Um, but his slider is not a new pitch. He's thrown that type of breaking ball before. But he, what he's trying to do with it is get more uh, north-south movement, or really more south movement, versus east-west movement with it. And his feeling on that, I asked him after his, last, his first start of the spring, well, what's the goal with that? Why have it be more of a vertical uh, breaking ball than a horizontal or sweeper breaking ball? And he just said, when I missed with it last year, and it was more of the uh, Mm east-west slider, it was non-competitive to the point that it it didn't get swings. Like, it didn't tempt hitters enough. And so it was almost like a wasted pitch. And the hope now is that it's got a little bit more of a vertical bite to it. And so that even if you don't throw it perfect, that it's going to travel more through the zone or spend more time close to the strike zone, and it might tempt hitters to swing and miss or put it in play, and so that it can be a pitch that generates value more often when it's not thrown perfectly, which I think that's interesting. Uh, With Paddock, this is a new slider for him, and it's intended basically to balance against his slow curve that he's thrown for much of his career which is much more of like a 70-something mile an hour kind of old school, I don't want to say Bly Levin-esque because it's not that good, but it's what you think about like when you were in high school and somebody threw a curveball. It was more of a big breaking slow thing. Now he wants more of like a sharp slider that can play more off the fastball and trick the eye a little bit. And then you toss in the the changeup, which has always been his best pitch. And the goal basically is, well, he's back to starting now, and he needs as many weapons that he can turn to uh, as he can. So I think that's interesting. I I think think it's... Oh, go ahead. It's not always noteworthy when a pitcher is working on a new pitch. That's what happens. And the Twins especially love that. I mean, their their coaches, Pete Mackey and all their other pitching coaches, they're constantly tinkering. They're constantly looking at pitch mixes. You know, is this pitch, can we ditch this pitch and bring in a new pitch like they did with Pablo Lopez to huge success last year? Or is there something about this pitch that, you know, you have great spin rate on it, but you're throwing it too high in the zone or you're it's, right. you're looking too vertical instead of horizontal. Like, can we take one good aspect of this and tweak it so that it can more maximize the strength and minimize the weakness? And so, you know, every spring you're going to have guys showing up to camp and it's like, oh, I'm working on this new pitch. I'm working on that. I would love someone to track that and at the end of the year go, here were the 62 pitchers who said they were working on the <laughs> right, yeah, that's what, you yeah. know. Half of them did, never threw that pitch in a game. Right. Well, I mean, and and half that, of the that, ones right. that did, the pitch stunk or something. But. That's right. I mean, and they'll talk about that. They'll like, listen, they'll, I, I think Panic actually talked about it. Like, well, the goal is to get it to the point where it's ready to go. I've, I've been working on it all off season. Right now, right. I'm tr- now I'm here to test it out against hitters, and we'll, you know, the goal is to feel comfortable enough to throw it in June when you're you know down two zero and you need to find a you know a new pitch to kind of get them. I I think. In his outing yesterday, his last pitch. Paddock. To, You're talking about Paddock? Yeah, Paddock. Yeah, in his outing yeah. yesterday in Atlanta. We didn't have pitch data on that one, but I think it was the um, – it might have been the at bottom of the third. I think the last pitch he threw was a slider to Ozzie Albies and that he ended up striking him out with. Now, it might have been his changeup. I don't know because we didn't have the stat cast data, but I, I thought he right. was a slider and they, he was real excited about it. And Jeffers was real excited to come up and give him a fist bump after it. Like, yeah, that's well, exactly where we've got that pitch. So. And by the way, this is part of the reason that guys like me and you have spent a decade trying to convince people not to get too attached to spring training performances, good or bad. Right. Yeah, of course. It's because. Guys are legitimately working on <laughs> right, things. Yeah, right, right. And you can't test things you've been working on unless you do it in games. Like you can't truly test it. Right. And you have to also just be comfortable using new pitches. Like you could, it's all theoretical until you get out there against the actual enemy 
And Pablo Lopez was a great example the other day, but two, three days ago, um, my last day there, I guess, he gave up a two-run homer on a 1-0, I want to say, curveball inside, which was a real weird pitch for him. And it was like, we asked him afterward, like, oh, that was a mistake, huh? And he goes, well, yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't care that the guy hit it for a homer. My goal with that pitch was to be able to throw that pitch in any count uh, and to get it in the strike zone is what I'm working on. And just in general, they use this time, especially early in camp, right? You know, first half of right. the games, right. to just try stuff and tinker with stuff. And so you might look at end of the spring and you might go, ooh, Pablo Lopez, you know, he he's not a good bet yeah. to repeat last season because he gave up uh, three homers or something. Just keep in mind that, you know, they're they're experimenting basically. And some you gotta what? You gotta break a few eggs to make an omelet. Is that the uh is that the saying? You're the omelet king of of Minneapolis, <laughs> yeah, right, that, John? that is the correct thing. Uh so that's part of it. Okay. Also on the pitching front, you may have noticed uh Anthony Di Sclafani has not pitched yet this spring. And we noticed that also. Uh sore elbow. Elbow soreness is the official diagnosis there. Uh, He's behind in camp. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to get ready in time for opening day. But the the word from Nick Paparesta this morning sounds like from uh, Twins Camp again, where neither of us are there, but um, that the hope is still that he'll be ready for opening day. But that explains why he hasn't pitched yet. Caleb Theobar also hasn't pitched yet in a game because of a hamstring soreness. Okay. Uh, But... The hope, obviously, is he'll be ready for opening day, too. Di Sclafani is interesting because, you know, elbow soreness, he's had a long history of arm problems. Right. I mean, that's why he's on the Twins because right. he was available. And so that's worrisome because he's your fifth starter. He was supposed yep. to be the depth. Yeah. And if the depth is injured, then you're back to the drawing board. Now, they have Louis Varland, and that's a damn good six starter. I mean, that's one of the best six starters of any team in baseball. And I personally might even bet on Louis Varlin outperforming uh, Anthony Di Sclafani this year. If you gave him both sure. 150 innings or something, yeah. the goal was to have both of them to have right. Di Sclafani again as your first line of defense, Louis Varlin as your second line of defense. So the question over the next several weeks will be or next two weeks. Let's say, can he advance to pitching in games? Di Sclafani to the point that he can start to throw two, three, four innings, and you can at least map out a situation where he can throw four or five innings, you know, the first week of the season. Although they may not need a fifth starter the first time through the rotation, he could theoretically begin the year on the IL. They could use an extra reliever during that time, and then you jump, bump him because they're going to have two off days. Yeah, they do. You're going to have an off day after the first game of the season. And then you're also going to have an off day after your first home game. Yeah, they've got three off days in their first eight games, or eight eight days, or nine days of the right. season. So they've got the the they they play on Thursday. Then the Friday is always an off day because in case they have opening day, right? Right. Then they've only got a two game series versus Milwaukee. So they have them. They have that Friday, that Monday, and then the following Friday off, right? And so then the first time they have a long stretch of games is starting April sixth, where they have let's see, whoo. 12 games in a row. So yeah, right. they're going to be, they're going to need a fifth starter at least twice during that. Uh, during right. That so obviously, like I said, the hope is that he's going to start throwing off a mound here within the next, you know, early next week. He'll still, I mean, if that's the case and it's just elbow soreness that they're past, he will have time to build up to four or five innings by the, by opening day. But if he needs an extra five or 10 days, they have the ability to kind of wait that out. If it proves to be more than that, Well, then it gets tricky because the entire point of bringing him in was to kind of avoid that situation. You can, again, turn to Louis Varlin. That's not a problem at all. Um, But if if it were to be a more serious elbow problem, if he were to start throwing in the next several days and it's still barking and they got to shut him down, well, then I I would think you have to start looking to the free agent market, which you actually hinted at on the last Patreon. You were talking more about like a minor league deal. Yeah, what I heard is that they were looking. They they were interested in finding free agent pitchers who are still out there that are that were were willing to sign a minor league deal. And right. I mean, most of the starting pitchers that are out there, the names that you would recognize, even some of the names that you might recognize, like Jake Odorizzi, you know, somebody people who are coming back from either a tough year or something like that. Uh, you know, they want a major league contract. They are not willing to sign a minor league contract until there are no major league contracts, right? right. And the Twins need that, well, 
presuming Di Sclafani was healthy, the Twins needed a pitcher willing to accept a minor league deal because they signed somebody to a major league deal. They just end up bumping Di Sclafani off of the roster, uh, basically, or one of the other pitchers off of the roster. The only guys who, of the five pitchers that the Twins were projected to have in their starting rotation, who have options left are Ober and Ryan, and neither of them are you're going to send down, right? Right. So it's you, not as simple as just saying, why don't they sign another starter right. and keep him and Di Sclafani? Because right. Then you're down a bullpen spot. Yeah. One of those guys is working relief at that yeah. point, which yeah. you don't really want. Or a six-man so yeah. rotation or something right. goofy like that. Like you're, that you're screwing around with a lot of stuff there. What you want is a veteran that you know you can have for some depth that you can stash in St. Paul for a while and then call them up when you need them. And they can't even have like an opt-out at the end of March if they don't make the roster because you're not planning on them making the roster. Well, that's all assuming Disclafani is healthy. Right. If he's right. hurt... Well, then, then those same names are still in the mix, right. but then you've opened up the possibility of a guy just jumping right onto the major league roster, in which case, you know, if Odorizzi or something wasn't keen on a minor league deal, right. he maybe could be keen on a major league deal. Although here's what I'll say about Jake Odorizzi. Super good guy, had a good year for the Twins, not such a good second year for the tw- or third year for the Twins. Uh, I don't know that I would count on him no. joining camp in midstream and being ready for opening day or opening week necessarily. That's the problem that you're running into. I mean, these guys, I will say pitchers in general, keep themselves much more ready throughout the offseason than 20 years ago or 10 years ago. You really only need to get them up to 45 or 60 pitches at this point. Right. It depends what these guys, we don't know what these guys have been doing behind the scenes. But you start to get into, I mean, like you have Montgomery and Snell at the top of the market still unsigned. After that, you start to get into like Michael Lorenzen, who's a pretty good starter, I would might even say better than Di Sclafani or better bet. Sure. But he's kind of like the Michael Taylor of pitchers. He might still be waiting for a $10 million deal or something I think like he that. might be waiting for a multi-year deal. Right. You, know, with you, right? Uh, yeah. you start to get Mike Clevenger, uh, similar market. I don't really see them bringing him in for a personality standpoint, but whatever. Um, then you go a level below that is probably what I would envision them yeah. shopping in because we just talked about they may have gotten Margot because he cost a few million bucks less than right. someone right. else. Well, that means they don't really have much money for a pitcher. And so you right. might have to be given a pitcher like a one year, $2 million, $3 million deal. Well, then you're getting into like old friend Rich Hill, who's right. 200 years old, which yeah. I personally would love to see. One, he pitched pretty well last year, even he was 43. But two, he's the only guy who's older than me still who could be in the majors. <laughs> so I want to see that. Right. Right. Uh, you know, Zach Grinke, who's also older than me, I think. They could sign him. He didn't seem to have much left last season. Right. Uh, Noah Syndergaard, who a few years ago everyone wanted but has been kind of terrible since coming back from injury. You got to get into like the Dallas Keuchels of the world. I mean, we saw what right, he had yeah, left. Right, yeah. And then one name that you had mentioned was Vince Velasquez, who's been yeah. sort of a well-traveled, off-injured righty, was with the Phillies. Was with, I mean, he's been with a bunch of teams. Um, th- that's kind of the group you're looking at. That's not what you want. But if the goal is just sort of buy more time, push Varlin back to AAA, push some other guys down on the depth chart, and just have a somewhat competent veteran make – you know, six to 10 starts or something in the first half of the season. And so you can reevaluate. Well, that was what they were hoping Di Scalfani would do. And it's still right. possible he can do that, but it wouldn't surprise me if they start, they're starting to, you know, kick the tires yeah. on some of those models. Yeah. I right wonder now. the same thing. I wonder if they, if they've got, if they get to the point where they're like, yeah, we're worried about Di Scalfani rather than just immediately turn to Varland. If they still bump Varland down and sign, you know, look for somebody who's willing that they have some faith in. And that they is willing to sign a one year three million dollar major league right. contract, something like that. Where, yeah, which I mean, I mean you can mixed, get I've really got, chill I'm, for that. I mean, I've got mixed feelings on that in a lot of ways. One of the ways I have a mixed feeling on that is this team tends to stick with veterans beyond when they should, even if they stink, even if they sign for three million dollars, they don't walk away from that uh, because they care that much about the depth. So you know, if the guy just it doesn't pitch well, like doesn't, isn't terrible, doesn't get hurt, you know, but, you know, consistently gives you, you know, four innings of, you know, three run ball, something like that. You're like, eh, they might just keep trotting him out there. I was like, ah, I yeah. Well, I mean, we saw that with Keiko last year in the right. second half, right? And right. actually, the point at which I think right, we were and probably most uh, onlookers were ready to get rid of him, which is after he got knocked around for like seven runs. 
was it in Pittsburgh or something? Right, yeah. I right. forget the team. Right. The twins stuck with him. Yeah, right. And it paid off in yeah, the yeah, sense did. that yeah, he was right. pretty damn good for the next several yeah. stars. Yeah, he had like half of his stars were, were really good and the other half right. were terrible. Right. Yeah. right. And so that's sort of what you're talking about. I mean, another option would be if Di Scalfani has to begin the year on the IL, either with a serious injury or he's just, you know, needs three more weeks or whatever. You could go with Varlin. Sure. And then you could attempt to assign one of these guys to a incentive laden minor league deal with like a June opt out and kind of fill Varlin's spot at AAA with them. And then you're basically saying to Louis Varlin, here's your chance. You can pitch well here and never give back this rotation spot ever. Right. Yeah. Or you can end up just being a placeholder. And if you struggle a little bit, uh, we could send you back to AAA. And then call upon this veteran, you know, an Odorizzi type, a Velasquez type or yeah. something to to fill in. So I could see it going both. Obviously, the hope is, and they seem, I don't know, again, we're not there. We're only going off boats and stuff. But they seem relatively optimistic that Di Sclafani will be ready by opening day or shortly thereafter. But also. Yeah. I mean, and we're also talking specifically about sort of getting through that first month of the season for everything. Right. Like, we should mention that there's a lot of optimism in the, in camp, I think, about a number of the guys that are going to be getting the season at St. Paul who are either prospects or former prospects of some sort. Simeon with Richardson's velocity seems to be up there. Matt Cantorino is back throwing. Uh, he made his first start yesterday, looked awfully well, had a, good and bad, but boy, he had, he made Jordan, poor Jordan Luplos feel completely overmatched. Like it was, uh, it was an interesting, interesting he, outing. He looked pretty damn good for a guy who hasn't pitched in right, 20 months. I'll right, say exactly that. right. Yeah, I mean, they, uh, and, and we, that doesn't count Festa, who we've been talking about all offseason. Like, and Varlin, some, they, yeah, by yeah, the way. Not to mention Varlin. Like, that's going to be a kick-ass rotation in St. Paul that you would think the Twins would lean into mm. at some point. So. I don't think there's going to be any kick-ass pitching in that well, league. In that, but, yes, I get what you're saying. Yeah, just, I mean, the Woods Richardson one is a big one. I mean, if he's throwing 93-plus yeah. instead yeah. of 91-plus, yeah. Yeah, it's a completely different story because he yeah. has a good changeup. I mean, we really Reno is a huge X factor for sure. Yeah, the the, the radar guns in uh, minor league and spring training parks no longer vary quite as much as they used to because of Statcast and so on. You can trust them a little bit more. But the numbers he was putting up in Yankees in the, in the uh, Yankee spring training uh, arena were. Uh, I wrote about it this week on Trends Daily. You know, he averaged something like uh, 91 and a half or 90.3 or something fastball for his four-seam fastball across across the entire year last year. The slowest four-seam fastball he threw is 92.1, and he got up to 94 and a half. So, you know, that's uh, – and that is something that he talked about a week earlier with me about, like, yeah, we're trying to work on the velocity. We're doing some different things. So it'll be interesting to see if, A – that velocity work has paid off the adjustments that he's making, which is basically changing his arm slot and B uh, and using his athleticism more and B, you know, whether or not that has some uh, potential negative impacts as well, because the whole point of, you know, his high arm slot where he was is because it added some deception to his pitches or people going to get an early read on his pitches. So it's like last year, you know, they had not only Varlin as their seventh starter who had already started, I don't know, 10 games in the majors or something at that point. But they had Bailey Ober as their sixth right, starter yeah, right, yeah. in the AAA rotation. And that is such a luxury to have. Right. Bailey Ober might call it something different than a luxury. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was undeserved from his standpoint. Right, but absolutely. That's such a luxury to have. And it paid off huge for them. I mean, Bailey Ober ended up right. making 25 starts for them. Varlin ended up pitching a ton for yeah. them. They need they needed that depth. Yeah. And yeah. they're going to need that depth again, my guess is. Their concerns they were, actually... were well founded. Malley ended up not making Exactly. Them. Yeah, right. But the problem is that was a pretty unique situation to have your reigning um two time minor league pitcher of the year in Varlin right. stash at triple A and to have a twenty seven year old kind of proven third starter in Bailey Ober stashed at AAA. Right. Those are not, you, it's hard to duplicate those circumstances. Right. And so now it seems like, oh man, they just don't have as much depth. Well, they still have Varlin. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. They just don't have Bailey Ober. Well, yeah, that doesn't come along very often. It's very difficult to have an right. established major leaguer, uh, you know, mid rotation starter, three something ERA type of guy and go, yeah, hey, we're going to send you to AAA. That's just not a circumstance that plays out. So yes, you know, the, uh, Simeon Woods Richardson and David Festa and Brent Hedrick and maybe Matt Cantorino and those type of guys. Well, yeah, they're much, much, much less proven right. than Bailey Ober. But anyone 
is, is <laughs> right, triple a yes. depth is going to be less right. proven than bailey ober because bailey ober had no business being at triple a yeah. and so i think that's that's worth remembering most teams are in this spot unless they've signed a veteran to a minor league deal like you've talked about right and there's only so many of those to go around you're just going to be relying on minor leaguers you're going to be relying on prospects to be kind of the next next man up from a rotation standpoint let's just finish real quick and then we'll be done uh the twins announced that denard span who had been doing some Tampa Bay Rays stuff, I think pre and post game, and maybe some radio for them. I don't remember. Uh, is joining the rotating group of television analysts, uh, as well as pre and post game uh, desk stuff. Uh, he joins now Justin Morneau, who remains the primary analyst. I think he's scheduled to do like half the games, which might even be a little more than last season. Uh, Glenn Perkins, Trevor Plouffe, Roy Smalley. And Latroy Hawkins. They're all now working, of course, with new play by play man, Corey Provis, who's taking right. over for Dick Bramer. Uh, Denard Span was definitely, when he was a Twins player, super well liked, um, a good talker, uh, good player, too. Sure. Yeah. Good, great beard. <laughs> Just <laughs> tremendous. Sure. Now he's yeah. got a little salt and pepper yeah. in it. It looks a little, <laughs> it's interesting. I'm going for that look, too. We don't quite We were actually, off the same. he was one of the guys we were, uh, looked targeting for our uh, winter meltdown to be yes. uh, behind the scenes view uh we we found out that he had to leave town before the actual event so other than that uh, that's why we lost him so yes yeah, he was going to be a guest and but right. he had to leave town that happened a couple times uh this year so i think it's a good addition i think it's the changing of the guard on the tv front is basically complete now yeah. i mean you have provis who's replacing bramer who did the job for 40 years but then you also just think about where they were, I don't know, five years ago or eight years ago, whenever it was, to go from Bly Levin for the vast majority of the games and right. what the vibe and the content was then to now have this rotating group of other than Smalley, they're all from the you know 2000s era. Right, yeah. Right. Or even two, 2010s era, honestly. Yeah, right. uh, and Smalley is the one holdover, but I would say just generally speaking, Smalley is a little bit. Uh, more open to new school stuff than the right, average sure. you know, 60 something year old. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I think the mix of new school thoughts and recently retired, which is always key to me, you want guys telling stories right. about players they played with who are still playing changes a lot when right. it's right. guy telling a story from 40 years ago. Uh, and, you know, just, we know some of these guys behind the scenes, ploof has been on the podcast Perkins has been on the podcast twice. Hawkins has been on the podcast. Yeah. We tried to get Span on the podcast. I don't know why Morno hasn't been on the podcast yet. He, <laughs> we got to work on that. I, I have bad news he's for He's too Justin, busy with his kids. But he's going to be on the podcast <laughs> soon. Uh, I think it's a really good mix. And I also, just in general, setting aside who the primary person is, um, I like the idea of keeping it fresh with a rotating cast and crew. Now, there's a fine line there. You don't want to just have guys coming in for two games and they're not ready to do it and they're just sort of randomly talking. That's the danger. But when it's five or six guys like they have now, um, and a lot of them have a lot of experience with it, Sure, I, I think that's a great way to keep things fresh and not have to hear the same story over and over and not fall into the circle me Bert or he left to pitch up every time it's a right, homer. Yeah, you, yeah. you get everybody's best stories. You yeah, get everybody's right. best analysis, yeah. and they don't run into the danger of having to repeat themselves over and over and over again. Which I you only got so much material. We know. Yeah, I real. Yeah, I realize that's rich <laughs> coming from us. So we, believe right. me, I'm self aware to, right, to know yeah. that. Right. And I also just think Provis will do a very good job getting the most out of those guys because he's worked with a lot of them and he's friendly with a lot of them, and I think they're like minded. Uh, in a lot of ways that I think should come yeah. across well on the broadcast. So uh, I like what the Twins have done. Um, you know, I felt like at the end of the Blylevin bramer pairing, there was a lot of, uh, I don't know, there was a lot of meat left on the plate in terms of analysis and uh, meaningful content that they just never got to because they were just so locked into the stuff they've said a million times. Right. And I mean, Bert was just saying his catchphrases and stuff. Sure. And I think the change to Morno and then Perkins and Ploof and keeping Smalley and adding in guys like Spann and, and Hawkins as part of the mix has been huge just in terms of keeping it fresh and actually analyzing baseball in a way that yeah. it's being analyzed in front offices and clubhouses, modern looks at things i think has been huge and, oh, and then the other um tim laudner is returning or staying 
as their main uh, pre and post game, which I'm a little surprised, but he's also, by the way, been on the podcast, right? That's true. He's he's the first ever winter meltdown guest that uh, mocked, openly (laughs) mocked the crowd for being nerds. That's right. right. Yeah, that's right. Is this this group of these analytics phones? And everybody's like, yeah. And he's like, yeah, you guys suck. You're spreadsheet guys. Yeah, you (laughs) bunch of spreadsheet nerds. Anyway, um, that I'm surprised by that, not setting aside him specifically, but like we said, other than Smalley, this has been a turnover and a newer yeah, school, right. different era. And so I'm a little surprised that he's hung on. Um, but yeah, that's that's gonna be your group. And I think some of those guys will mix into the to the pre and post game stuff. Yeah. Uh Audra Martin returns as the primary uh sideline oh, reporter. Cool. And question asker post game. <laughs> right. You always uh when you see the Starting pitcher or Rocco post game with the Twins logo uh, wall behind them. The first questions are often asked by Audra. A little behind the scenes on that. Uh, I don't know. Keep in mind with Laudner. Here's what Laudner does before he goes on the air. A lot of the time, he sits in my seat with an unlit cigar <laughs> and goes over his game notes. That's right. Yeah. Till I walk up and say, "Oh, hey, uh, you're in my seat," uh, and he goes, "Oh, I am. I am." For the four hundredth <laughs> time, anyway, that's that's where we got him. So, uh, and I think Katie Storm will also be back uh, okay. doing some some sideline and pre and post game stuff too. So, Denard Span, the big addition. Um, yeah, well, blackouts are still blackouts. Yeah, you but still won't be able voice. to stream it down. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what to say that we haven't already said on that. Okay, uh, we will be back with Tuesday, a free episode. Probably? Yeah, we'll be no. back with Patreon episode Tuesday. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And we'll be back with a free episode a week, two weeks from today. Is yeah. What is the plan? That's so. a long time to wait for another free episode. So join yeah. the Patreon. Yeah. You'll P-A-T- enjoy it. It's a P A T R E O N. Yeah. Patreon.com slash Gleeman. They're $1 an episode, and you only get charged when we put out the new episode. So if we, we go a week and we don't put out a new Patreon, you can listen to the archives for free. And when we put out a new one, you'll get billed a buck for it. Uh, Perfect time to join. You got about, I don't know, three, four weeks left of spring training. We'll almost Easy. assuredly have a mailbag next week so you can get your questions yeah. in. We we, uh, we used to try to do mailbags on this uh, piece at the end of every episode. Every episode we ran out of time because we continue talking like we do right now. And so we just started picking, putting all mailbag episodes over on the Patreon side. Uh, and you'll you'll enjoy that. I, we got to always get a lot of really interesting questions and topics from the, from the listeners. Yeah. Sign up, ride with us. It's, it'll cost you a buck or two a week leading up to the season, and then probably two bucks a week yeah. uh, during the season. But there's, uh, I don't know, what do we got? Forty two hundred people signed up, something like that. Something like that. So it's a it's a decent sized club. You don't even yeah. have to feel that weird about being part of it now at this point. There's almost five thousand people in it. So and great Patreon. new bumper music. Yeah, great new bumper music. That's true. Really really okay, keep uh, keep joining so that we can keep having the money to play pay these actual musicians to come up with fun. Because we do that. That's right. All right. Goodbye. Bye bye. Good evening.